Thank, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, we're going to talk about how to manage anxiety, right? Learn to befriend your thoughts. Um, now, I will first start with a bit of an introduction as well. Um, and I will move on to the next slide here. Uh, let's see if that's going to go. Yes. All right. So, um, I'm also very grateful to work, live and play on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples and the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. Um, I am a registered clinical counselor working for North Shore CBT Center. Um, our clinic, it's a private clinic. Um, it is located on Marine Drive, um, just before the Lionsgate Bridge, as you can see here in the in the small Google Map picture that I uh, have here on the slide. Um, we provide uh, therapy services and diagnostic assessments. Um, I myself, I am specialized in treating um, anxiety, uh, anxiety-related disorders, um, OCD, depression, uh, trauma, and, and, and anything related to that. But my specialization is mostly anxiety and OCD. Um, yeah, now uh, today we will mostly be talking about um, anxiety and um right it is something that we all experience uh everyone so, once in a while right has has a moment of worry uh, some worry thoughts here and there um and and uh it is really about how do you react to these thoughts uh, and so that's what we will be talking about today um a little bit more about me um i immigrated to canada uh, about 10 years ago now uh, from the netherlands uh, so you might hear i have a bit of an accent um i always let people guess where i'm from uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, hard hard to really hear um yeah so i've been working uh, and living um here in in uh, vancouver uh, for about those 10 years now, uh, building up my career as a counselor. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, if you are interested to connect with me, um, I would be more than happy to. Um, yeah, so a little bit about the aim of this workshop, right? What are we going to talk about? Now, how to befriend your thoughts. Um, change the relationship with your thoughts by becoming aware of negative thinking patterns. Right. And also you will learn about the mind body connection and how to take care of your nervous system. Um, so two very important uh, goals here. Um, and so we keep on talking about that mind body connection because they're so very much connected with each other. Right. Anything uh, that happens in the brain has an effect on the body. Right. And, and physical sensations that we're feeling. Um, it affects our nervous system. Um, and we will talk more about that uh, in the next slides. Now, I provide a therapy called uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, or we call it CBT. Um, and um, this therapy is, is mostly like a, a structured, present-oriented therapy uh, focused on modifying unhelpful thinking and behavior. Um, the founder of, of this therapy modality was Beck, Aaron Beck, uh, and uh, he uh, created uh, this theory in 1964. Now, a quote from him here is like, it's not the situations in our lives that cause distress, but rather our interpretations of those situations. Right? So the way that we interpret situations and um, um is is very subjective right um it's uh we look through certain glasses uh into the world um, and we have our own interpretation um totally um kind of formed by our childhood experiences by our life experiences um and and we look at the world in a certain way but we can also change that thought frame uh, and that's kind of what CBT uh, wants to help people with. Um, how can we change and reframe our thoughts um, and, and uh, our behaviors so that our feelings uh, uh, change into, uh, you know, a more satisfied, happy life? Um, now, in the picture on the right, you can see 
uh, the four pillars of CBT therapy, right? So we focus on the thoughts, we focus on the behaviors, um, and then, of course, they will influence feelings, right? How we're feeling. And we, we focus on body sensations. So they're all related to one another, right? But CBT mostly says, well, it all starts with either um, an interpretation of the world, a thought, right? Um, and that influences our behavior and our feelings and our body sensations. Um, and, and sometimes also it starts with a feeling, right? And then we suddenly realize, oh, we, we had a thought. <laughs> Uh, and, and then we start doing something. So these four pillars are um, interrelated. Now, an example here. Uh, when you look at the left picture, right? Uh, this person is sitting behind a laptop, uh, is not happy. And, and perhaps the thought is, I am not qualified for this job. Right? The feeling that this person is feeling is sad, defeated maybe embarrassed, um, and behavior might be uh, quitting the job, right? Or, or procrastinating, not being motivated. Now, on the right, you see a very happy uh, person behind a laptop, and, and uh, this person has had an alternative thought. Oh, I can learn and improve with practice, right? It's, it's okay to make a mistake. I'm, I'm in training, right? Uh, so the new feeling could be empowered, interested and hopeful, right? And a new behavior is, okay, doing your best because you're motivated again. So when we change the thought, right, we can change the feelings, we can change the behaviors. Sometimes we start with a behavior and then the feeling changes and then the thought changes. So it goes uh, kind of up and down, but also from from um from below to up um so this is kind of the the main uh purpose of cbt therapy now the human brain um consists of an emotional brain part which is kind of more in the middle right uh kind of in the upper part of the neck almost um, and it is part of the limbic system, uh, and is where emotion um, is processed. Now, we sometimes say, well, emotion is the emotional area is kind of like the thumb, right? And you, when you put your thumb in your hand and you put the rest of the fingers over, right? So this part is like the thinking brain, the logic brain, and the emotional brain is kind of uh, deep inside of the brain. It is one of the first parts of the brain uh, that developed. Um, and um, what we see often is when people are very emotional, right? When we are very overwhelmed, the emotional area of the brain is very active. Uh, but at such a moment, it is sometimes very difficult to, to reach the thinking brain. Uh, so the connection between the thinking brain and the emotional brain um, is sometimes um, and not that flexible. Uh, and so people could get stuck in an emotional state. Uh, for example, we see that when there is a dysfunction happening, like uh, depression um, or very high anxiety, right? Uh, where people are kind of stuck in that emotional part of the brain and are not really able to make the connection to the thinking brain. So therapy will... Um, facilitate that connection. And so we try to build uh, cognitive flexibility, as they call it. So the connection between the thinking brain and the emotional brain. Um, now we do that by first focusing on calming down the body. That's often the only way uh, to really um, kind of create some space in the brain and, and to calm down that emotional area of the brain. Now, looking at this picture, right, we see um, kind of the human stress response. Now, this is all regulated by our nervous system, right? And our nervous system is always looking for threats, right? Is there any threat around us? Are we safe, right? Now, when we are in the safe zone and, and we feel calm and, and connected, we are in the green zone. 
uh, right? We can socially engage, we can talk, we are cu curious, uh, we are open uh, and mindful. Now, whenever we perceive some kind of a danger, right? Uh, we start going into the yellow zone, the fight or flight, right? It's uh, kind of a more restless feeling comes up, a bit of irritation, anger. Um, some people feel fear and or panic symptoms. Um, and, and there is this um, tendency to either fight, right? So fight, so react, or flight, uh, avoidance, running away from it, right? So either... Uh, reaction is possible there. Now, when the when the threat becomes very high, like for example a life threat, um, the nervous system freezes. So, what it does, it basically uh, goes into shutdown state, right? So that is kind of a depressed state of of dissociation and feeling numb, right? Helpless and kind of trapped. Uh, and, and, and you're just kind of um, conserving energy, so to say. Um, and we see it in animals too, right? I and mean, they're kind of, when they play dead, for example, or they, they lay on, on the ground, right? And, and they, uh, they just kind of fall down in a numb state. They are also in this freeze, um, immobile state of the nervous system. Now, the body can never stay all the time in that uh, hypo aroused state so that that red zone can never uh, take like all the time the body is going to go automatically into deactivation um, and so we call that down regulation when we go down from a from a very high anxiety curve we go down again towards green uh, or at least uh, you know towards yellow um, and so this is what happens whenever we see, uh, you know, something happens on the street or we have a trigger thought and we suddenly, uh, right, get into fight or flight mode, right? Um, now, sometimes when um, our system, our nervous system is extra alert, um, which we call anxiety, right? When we have anxiety and it, we, we go to from green to red, way faster every time right so you would go from zero to ten uh within within a couple of minutes right and, and maybe several times a day um and so that can be very tiring um when people go through these um mood swings um over over the span of the day um but yeah it is it is very normal for everyone to go through these movements, right? Um, but a little bit more, um, yeah, stabilized. Um, so let's look at the next slide here. So the window of tolerance. Um, this is the same um, system, but then um, kind of differently illustrated. So what you can see, uh, right, the ends of the rainbow are the extreme distress points, either very, very um, uh, hyper activated, right? As in a high anxiety, or on the left, you see very um, kind of a low effect, like some uh, somebody who's really depressed, right? On the left side of the rainbow. Um, and, and somewhere in between, there is that window of optimal functioning for everyone. Right. This is where growth happens. That is the green zone. Um, so it's always good to know what are your triggers? What brings you into that hyperactive mode? Right. That restless, anxious mode. Or what does bring you into depressed mode? Right. Are there certain thoughts? Are there certain situations? Now, how can you keep yourself in that optimal functioning um, area there? Right? Maybe uh, by taking a break sometimes, um, by, by using your coping skills. Um, and we will talk more about coping skills um, in, in the later slides. Um, so very important to be mindful of your mental health. And, and you are definitely mindful because you're here in the workshop. So that is, that is a first step, right? Um, now, let's have a look at the next 
next slide. Whenever we are kind of experiencing stressors during the day, right? Um, it's always uh, very important to ask yourself, what do you actually have control over? Am I thinking about things that I don't, can't even control, right? Now, in the picture you see, there, there's a green area of, of things you can control, right? Then there is a yellow area, things you can influence, but not control. And then there is a red area, things you cannot influence at all, right? And so for the red zone, um, you could be thinking of, uh, you know, the weather, right? We, we can't really influence the weather, <laughs> um, any environmental um, happenings, right? But we do influence that as human beings, right? Global warming, Um now, what about uh, natural disasters, right? Uh, they are, that's all part of that red zone. Now, what do you think about your thoughts? What do you think about your actions and your feelings? Physical sensations. Do you think you can, you can control them? Um, do you feel like you can influence them but not fully control? What I hear uh, people often say is, is like, they say feelings, I'm not sure if I can directly control them, right? But we can influence them. Um, and physical sensations as well, right? Sometimes we already just randomly feel a sensation come up, um, but we can influence it and manage it, right? Now, what about other people? Where do you think other people would, would fit in that picture? What about your dog, right? Um, probably they are things you can influence, but not fully control, right? We can't control the emotions of other people. Um, we can't control uh, what they're thinking, right? Well, we can influence at least, uh, you know, by making connection with them, by talking to them. Uh, so, yeah, that, that falls kind of in that yellow zone here. Right, so let's talk about thoughts a little bit more. Now, our brain actually processes 70,000 thoughts each day. That's, that's a very, very high number. Uh, we use 100 billions of neurons that connect through synapses and that traveled 300 miles per hour. The basic wiring of your brain is determined by uh, your genetic makeup, uh, but life experience is uh, responsible for fine tuning of the brain. So when you go through life, all the, all the events you go through, they have an effect on you uh, and on uh, the growth of your brain. And so, we have so many thoughts in our mind, right? Um, and sometimes we don't, we are not even aware of them. Um, so, are all these thoughts? Are they all meaningful? Are all these thoughts true? And that's actually the question that I wanted to ask here, right? What is your relationship with your thoughts? Do you every time that you have a thought, do you, do you think this is a true thought? This, me, this gives me a truth about the world or about me or about somebody else, right? We often, for our daytime thoughts, we say, yeah, we think they're true, right? Just because we think them, they're true. Um, but I don't agree. We should look at our thoughts as products of the mind and they sometimes, you know, by association are, are randomly formed. Um, and so... Uh, you don't have to take every thought that you have uh, very serious. Um, always be critical on your own thoughts. Um, because one thought is only a, an interpretation, right? And there, there's many interpretations possible. So become an observer of your own thoughts, right? And you can kind of look at it. Uh, we sometimes use the metaphor uh, clouds in the sky, right? Let them fly by, right? And, and you, you don't have to be in the cloud, right? You can just take a step back and look at the sky 
and see your thoughts fly by. Um, so I have a little video here, um, which is um, kind of really um, exemplifying how, you, how can you look at your thoughts and how can you see your thoughts just fly by. Um, and in this example, the thoughts are actually pieces of sushi. Um, so I'm going to start this video and hopefully uh, you can hear uh, this sound as well. So imagine that you're sitting in front of a sushi train at one of those Japanese restaurants and there are all these dishes going past on the train. And in the centre there is the chef creating all of these dishes. The chef is like your mind and the dishes are like all of those thoughts, ideas, memories that keep cropping up, coming and going all day long. Some of the dishes on that sushi train may be very appealing. Some of the stuff on that sushi train may be unappealing. And some of it may be neutral and take it or leave it. And it's much the same with our thoughts, memories, ideas that pop up throughout the day. Some of them are very pleasant, we really like them, we want them, we want to hold on to them. Some of them are very unpleasant and we just want to turn away from them, get rid of them. And a lot of them are kind of neutral, they're neither positive nor negative. So all day long the sushi chef of our mind is creating all these different dishes and the train keeps carrying them round and round. These thoughts keep cropping up throughout the day. Now we can learn to step back and watch our thoughts coming and going in much the same way that we can step back and watch that sushi train. An unpleasant dish pops up on the train, we don't have to turn away in disgust and horror. A pleasant dish comes by, we don't have to reach over and grab it and stuff it down our mouth. And we can do the same with our own thoughts. We can step back with an attitude of openness and curiosity and watch them come and stay and go in their own good time. All right, so the idea, right, of stepping back, stepping back and observing your own thoughts um, is, is um, a very, very strong idea. Um, and it comes forward in, in most of the therapy modalities as well, is um, learning to create space between yourself and your thoughts. You don't have to always put attention, pay attention to the thought, right? You don't have to grab it and, and, and spend hours thinking about it, right? Um, now, of course, that is a practice. Stepping away from the thoughts is, is sometimes not easy. Uh, and, and it is actually part of mindfulness practice. Um, so part of, of kind of uh, therapy and therapeutic uh, modalities um, is um, uh, mindfulness. Um, so stepping away, as you can see here, um, right, when you're in that cloud of, of thoughts, um, it is called cognitive fusion. Um, you are fused with your thoughts. When you are um, kind of able to look at your thoughts from a distance, it is called cognitive diffusion. So you can kind of step away um, and, and the, you can observe the cloud from a distance. Now, some thoughts are a bit more sticky than others, right? Thoughts about yourself, um, like I am not smart enough, or I look strange, or I probably can't do it, right? No one wants to be friends with me or nobody likes me, right? We call these thoughts automatic negative thoughts. They are like small ants that kind of creep through your head and they can uh, show up at unexpected moments, right? And, and um, whenever you're in, in out in the world, in conversations, you have an interview and there we go, right? There's the thought, oh, I'm probably not smart enough. Oh, they're not gonna hire me. Um, now, we don't have to necessarily listen to these thoughts um, as they're often programmed uh, kind of throughout our childhood. Perhaps there was someone uh, who, who told 
uh, us that we are not smart enough, right? But you don't have to listen to that, right? You don't have to identify with that anymore. Um, and so you can ask yourself, is this thought true? Right? That's a, the that's a first thing you can ask. Is this helpful to, uh, to think this right now? Is this inspiring? Is this necessary? Probably not, right? And the last one is an important one. Is this actually kind to myself? How can I become um, a supporter of myself instead of a hater, right? Um, so this is kind of um, a way of testing your, your automatic negative thoughts. Um, so you can use that acronym that you see here on the screen, THINK. Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, or kind? Now, another way is reframing your thoughts. Um, now, reframing means changing your thoughts, right? If you have the thought, I am an unlikable person and I will never find a partner, for example. Now, have a look at the questions on the right. You can ask yourself, well, wait a second, what is a more helpful thought in, the, in this moment? Because thinking I'm unlikable um, you know, it's only gonna, gonna, uh, yeah, uh, make me unhappy. I keep my confidence very low. Um, so what is another possibility? What are my strengths? Do I have strengths? Um, and if you don't know, what would the people who care about me say? Uh, maybe you can ask. And what is the worst that could really happen, right? If the worst case happened, how will you deal with that? And uh, if my friend had this thought, what would I tell them, right? You can also ask yourself, can I be 100% sure this is true? Can I find evidence for it? Now, what is the best possible outcome, right? Is there a positive outcome uh, instead of a negative outcome that I can focus on? So these are all ways to kind of play with those thoughts and, and change them whenever they uh, become very negative. Now, our brain often falls into thinking traps, um, right? We, we are often very one-sided in our view. Um, you can actually create a more realistic, calm thought if you know what thinking trap you're falling into. Now, here on the right, you see some of those thinking traps. For example, um, the all or nothing thinking feeling like a failure because you made a small mistake, right? Um, right away thinking that you're a total, total failure because uh, you made that one error um, is a, an example of all or nothing thinking. And, and we all do that. Um, everyone does this, right? Because we are just so focused on protecting ourselves from harm. Um, and so... Uh, we really try to, um, yeah, make sure that uh, nothing will happen to us. And so uh, we have a protective mechanism uh, helping us, uh, which is our brain. So our brain is continuously scanning, are we in danger or not? Um, and if it sees the smallest danger, for example, you making a mistake, it now thinks, oh, no, you're in danger. Uh, you are a failure you need to improve yourself. So thoughts and emotions can motivate us to get better, right? But we can sometimes get stuck in these kind of thinking traps. So at that moment, it's very important to become aware uh, what thinking trap we are stuck in. Now, another one is discounting the positive, right? Only focusing uh, on the negative aspects, looking back on your life and, and always thinking of the negative events and never really focusing on um, everything that anything that was positive there. Or mind reading, thinking that you know exactly what someone else is thinking. You walk on the street, you look at someone's face and you think, oh, this person hates me, right? And uh, that's definitely mind reading. We don't know what the other person went through that day. We don't know what their context is. And so we are definitely mind reading in that, in that moment. Then there is labeling. 
assigning labels to yourself and others, right? Being very uh, judgmental about others without really uh, knowing what is going on with them. Then there's catastrophizing, and this is a very um, common one, predicting the worst outcome for a situation. Always thinking that the worst is going to happen, that the most negative thing is going to happen to you. Um, and, and people often um, focus that on, on themselves, right? Oh, I'm probably never going to um, make it, right? I'm, I'm never going to have the career that I dreamt of. Um, and with catastrophizing, often the words always and never are used. Uh, so if you do that a lot, um, yeah, maybe it's time to kind of uh, look at, at your thoughts there and see um, why are you catastrophizing, right? It's probably because you are afraid of something in the future. Now, we're going to make a little switch here. We're going to also look at emotions, right? Because we have a lot of thoughts, but they are causing us to feel things. And so it's important that, you know, whenever we, we have an emotion that's coming up, um, that we, that we can, can kind of calm ourselves down. Um, but having emotions is not necessarily a bad thing, right? An emotion shows you what you care about. Um, if a personal boundary has been crossed, uh, what we need to pay attention to, right? So usually when we start feeling an emotion, we can ask ourselves, okay, what's going on here? I am triggered. What am, do I care about here, right? Can I again create distance between myself and my emotion? But sometimes it's just so hard, right, to create that distance from yourself um, and from your emotions. Um, sometimes our brain becomes like an overactive smoke alarm system. And that happens when we have a lot of worries going on, anxiety, uh, right? Um, sometimes we already get triggered after detecting the slightest bit of smoke. So somebody only has to say something and there you go, you're emotionally triggered, right? There goes your smoke alarm. And so it's, it's very important if you feel that your smoke alarm system is really active, <laughs> a little too active, right? It's time to um, start using your coping skills um, and to, to calm down the body, to create space from your thoughts and see if there are any unhelpful patterns that you can change. Now, um, some symptoms of overactive alarm systems, uh, right? Uh, somebody with depression or somebody with anxiety. Um, now, I'd like to just talk about some of those symptoms because uh, they um, they are a bit different from each other. Um, and so it's always good to kind of know, um, know the symptoms and learn how to recognize them. So for depression, um, often it's like not caring about anything, but also feeling so physically exhausted, right? That you, for example, struggle to have a shower. Uh, there's the feeling of hopelessness, um, having no urge to be productive, mm, not wanting to be lonely, uh, and perhaps feeling uh, paralyzingly numb. Now, anxiety, right, is kind of that heightened state, that kind of hyperactive, restless state, right? Caring too much about everything, feeling physically restless. You can't stop moving, right? And people shake their legs or have certain tics as well. Um, and being scared of failure is a very common anxiety. Um, too overwhelmed at the thought of socializing, right? Getting very nervous um, of the idea of having to socialize. Feeling scared, um, everything coming at, at once and, and kind of also very overwhelmed. Now, anxiety often gives uh, give us a lot of thoughts, right? It gives us a lot of thoughts. Uh, well, depression can um, kind of more look as, as a very kind of inactive state, but it doesn't mean that there are no thoughts. Uh, definitely, um, depression is fueled by uh, negative um, thinking patterns as well. 
And again, right, you can see here, um, this is the picture we looked at before. Uh, yellow is kind of the anxiety zone, right? But then the red zone is more like the depressed zone. Um, now, how do we deal with challenging emotions? Now, the first thing that, that is important to, um, to learn is that we should respond instead of react. Now, reacting means right away, right? Right away giving that reaction. Um, now, responding means that you, you think about it a little longer. Right? You create space between you and, and your emotions. Um, you take a step back from it all. Uh, you take a breath. You keep on breathing. Right, You regulate yourself. Um, and then uh, what can help is using the stop skill. So I wanted to go over the stop skill with you all. Um, just uh, as a yeah, so, something that you can use uh, in your daily life uh, whenever you get really overwhelmed um, by an emotion. Now, uh, we start in the red zone there, right? You would first stop everything. You don't react, you don't move um, because your aim, emotion may want you to act without thinking. So it's important to stay in control, right? So you take a step back, take a step back, um, taking a deep breath uh, and don't act impulsively, right? Just Observe the emotion as if you are looking on, uh, um, yeah, as if you are looking at the clouds, actually, right? You're kind of looking at the clouds, see the emotions come by. Just observe them. Now, what are your feelings? What are the emotions? What are your thoughts there, right? What are others saying or doing? So you are now observing this. And then you would proceed mindfully. Right, you be you are aware. You think about the situation. Uh, you think about your feelings, but also the feelings of others. Right. So now that you have taken a step back, you have created some space. Um, you can now also think about the feelings of others. What is the other person feeling? And you need that thinking brain for that. Right. So now we are making the connection from the emotional brain to the thinking brain. Now, at that moment, you're going to think, okay, what consequences would your actions have? Uh, would they improve or worsen the situation? So you're kind of, um, yeah, looking at the pros and cons of, of doing certain actions. Are you going to lash out or are you actually going to respond, uh, you know, verbally? Are you going to negotiate or compromise, right? Um so you have created a little bit more space for yourself to think of the response you're going to give. Now, whenever we're very overwhelmed by our emotions, um, it is also very important, right, besides breathing, uh, to use some other relaxation methods like grounding. Um, and grounding means you down-regulate your nervous system, you slow it down, right? You connect yourself with the space that you're in, um, and you basically uh, help your nervous system to get out of that overwhelm. Now, one um, exercise that I usually like to uh, do with my clients is the five senses exercise. Now, if, um, if you're feeling, you know, overwhelmed, you're a bit kind of uh, floaty, you're not really uh, in, in, this, in the space, you're more in your head, and then this might be a helpful exercise. So you would basically just uh, put both feet on the ground um, and you would kind of look around you in the room. Now, slowly just look around uh, without thinking too much um, and you start observing five things you see around you. So you start kind of just slowly in, in as much detail as possible, you would um, start uh, describing the five things you're seeing. Then you go to four things you can touch with your body. Maybe the chair, maybe your shoes, right? Maybe you're holding your own hands, um, etc. Now, three things you hear. What are three things you're hearing around you? What are two things you smell? 
right? Is there anything you smell around you? Is there, you know, one thing you taste? And so you're kind of connecting with your five senses here. Um, and after doing that, you're a little bit more connected to your body. You're also a little bit more connected to the space that you're in. And um, if everything went well, you're a little bit further out of your head uh, and out of your worried state. Um, and so this is just something that you could do um, when you wake up, uh, when you feel overwhelmed, um, when you are in the bus and you feel a bit tired. And these are all moments that uh, you, can, you can try this out. Now, um, one other thing you can do, or several other things, if you feel really down, right? Sometimes we cannot really do all these grounding exercises or, you know, it's very hard to, to get ourselves motivated to think differently, right? So what we do then is we say, okay, do a very, very small action. By doing that one action, you kind of shift, shift your mind a little bit. Right? You either you step out of bed to brush your teeth, you water your plants a bit, you do the groceries or walk the dog or you meet with a friend or right? there's different activities and different levels of activities uh, that you can engage in. Now, sometimes when we change our behavior, we will change our feeling, even though we didn't feel like doing this action. Right? That's often the case. It's like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed. I feel down and out. I want to stay. Um, but it's very important whenever you do an action, you will see that your feeling will change, even though at first you think it, it was not going to change. Um, and we also really emphasize the importance of creating a routine. Um, healthy diet, so very important. And regular meals, right? Not one meal a day. Um, enough sleep um, really um, increases brain productivity um, and, and really helps brain development as well and keeps the brain healthy. Regular exercise um, and, and exercise is also walking, is also doing some stretches, right? Move the body. Um, social connections right very important to yeah of course um some people are more introvert than others uh, but uh, still everyone once in a while needs a bit of social uh, engagement um, and so that is also very important now connecting with nature uh, connecting with nature is uh, actually uh, kind of a natural medicine uh, when you are in nature your nervous system down regulates automatically um, and so um, yeah you will really kind of uh, have that natural feeling of, of rest in the body then of course having a purpose is is important too um, in life we always function better when we have some kind of a purpose uh, and a reason to wake up right so if we um even if we, if we have um, a small reason, you know, I wake up for my dog. Great, right? Um, I want to I wanna spend life with my dog. Um, or, you know, I, um, I have a purpose. I volunteer, right? Or I have a purpose and I have a career. Um, my purpose is um, raising kids, right? There are so many ways of having a purpose in life. And it doesn't always mean, you know, having a career or a high achievement uh, in, in our life. Uh, having a purpose means, you know, a reason for being. Um, so yeah, these are all very, very important things to, um, to implement into your life. Now, my last slide is actually about self-compassion, right? Again, we need to treat ourselves as, as you are your, your best friend. You know, um, embrace yourself with kindness and care. You're going to be the one who is with you <laughs> all the time, right? Throughout life. Um, so with that comes self-acceptance, right? We are not alone in being imperfect. 
we nobody is perfect right everybody hurts sometimes and it is a part of the human condition and so it's very important to love your authentic self and and create that relationship with yourself um and and treat yourself with kindness um and and then the connections with others will also flourish um, whenever you start with accepting and loving yourself um yeah i think that was the end of my powerpoint elham and i think maybe you can have a look at the the q a as well but uh, thank you so much for for having me here today thank you so much masha um, I just want to open uh, the floor to some questions. So we do have uh, a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the page. It has a box, uh, a chat box with a question mark on it. So if you have any questions for Masha, feel free to drop it in there and then uh, we'll address um, any questions that you might have. And we have uh, about 13 minutes to, to do so. So feel free to take a few minutes to write down any questions that you might have. I guess, Masha, I can start with my first question. Um, it's uh, it's actually to do with um, when you're when you're going to sleep, like when you're because sometimes in anxiety and insomnia go hand in hand. Um, right. What do you recommend when you're you are in that state? You're trying to go back to sleep, but and it just goes back and forth. What what is a tool that you would recommend to deal with something like that? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Uh, I know it's very hard to sleep when when you have a very worried mind. Um, so what we usually suggest uh, is several things. Uh, one thing is, of course, having a healthy sleep hygiene, right? So making sure you don't have your device right next to you, uh, <laughs> having them kind of further away from you. No screen time just before sleeping. Uh, no food just before sleeping, uh, which causes you know, more, more energy and activity in, in the body and brain. Um, but another thing is to like trying to, uh, right, kind of almost like observe your thoughts go by instead of thinking into every thought that comes up at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, that is a practice though. That's not that easy. And uh, it's almost like, right, kind of when you're meditating or when you're kind of, right, trying to uh, distance yourself a bit from the thoughts and just letting them fly by. Mm -hmm. um, what I sometimes also say is like a mind sh creating a mind shift for yourself. So either reading something uh, or just kind of listening to something and kind of uh, falling asleep like that. Or if, if you're already laying there for several hours, uh, a lot of people think I should stay in bed, um, mm -hmm. but it's not always helping. Actually, uh, going out of bed <laughs> is often very helpful. Um, but doing very, something very easy, like water a plant, walk to another room and stare out of the window for a bit and come back again. And that kind of creates that uh, small shift. Wait, so did I hear, just being a librarian, did I hear you say that reading helps to to calm down the mind? And okay, yes. that's really good to yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, of course, horror stories uh, might be a different different <laughs> thing, but <laughs> if it's a calming and, and something that, that you get a you know, go, gets to your happy place, and uh, that that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you. Um, we have one question here. How do we know who our authentic sense really is when we wear different hats in different situations? I've always struggled with this. Thanks. Yeah, that's such an interesting question. And right, our authentic self has been wears many hats. Right, in different situations, we we show up. All right in different roles um right so it's it's not necessarily always very clear like oh this is me right but there might be some dominant traits that come forward um when you would kind of look at your strengths so i would say start with looking at your strengths and your qualities and maybe you can ask some others hey what what, what do you usually see in me like what are my positive traits um and, and start by that so you can create a picture of, of how others see you and see if that kind of is similar to how you see yourself. Because those, um, the self-image and, and the image that have others that you uh, you think others have of you, right? They might differ a lot. Uh, so that's kind of to start off that self-exploration. Um, but it's very, very normal and common 
to uh, wear different hats in different situations. And it doesn't mean that um, you're then not yourself. But if certain situations feel very unnatural to you, right, then you might somehow not be yourself in that moment, right? So observe what are you feeling in certain situations? Are you very uncomfortable in certain uh, situations? Um, that might be a good moment to explore, oh, is a boundary crossed? Uh, am I doing something uh, kind of going against my values? Um, and that might kind of go against yourself, your the idea of yourself, right? So you might want to explore whenever you feel uh, uncomfortable in a certain situation. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I would suggest. Thank you. Uh, any other questions while um, while we have some time? Um, and while while you're thinking of that, I do have one more question for you, and, and maybe the last one. Um, but how do you support someone who does have anxiety? So we're uh, a lot. You know, we we have some tools for ourselves, but in if you do have someone else who is experiencing that anxiety, what what how would you recommend us supporting them in that in those moments? Yeah, exactly. So whenever, uh, so as a therapist, you mean, right? How would we, uh, yeah, work with someone who has anxiety? Yes, or work with someone, or even if it's like a family member, you know, you're trying, right. you know, yeah. especially if they're in that moment where they're catastrophizing, or, you know, how how do we help them mm -hmm. to get back down to that calm, calmer state, I guess? Yeah, well, I would definitely first help them uh, calm the body. That's the first step. Uh, so when we calm the body, we calm the nervous system and we create that connection between the emotional brain and the thinking brain, right? So the person calms down and kind of can have a different, a bit of perspective. Um, and then we can sit together, for example, and you can uh, kind of help them with realistic thinking skills, right? Um, is there maybe an alternative perspective that, that you can take here? Um, you know, are you... Uh, doing it always, never, right? Are you catastrophizing here? Um, and, and maybe pointing out how you see uh, things differently than the person um, in a very kind of subtle, uh, calming way. Um, so, yeah, I think those realistic thinking questions are, are kind of your best bet in that situation uh, and just helping the person create some more perspective. Well, thank you so much, Masha. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and, and your experience and your your um, um, knowledge with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Oh, I see I have one more question. Sorry. Oh, no, we got to thank you. So, Masha, no. people are thanking <laughs> you for, for um, your presentation today. Um, thank of course, you it was a pleasure. Thank you.